So, hello, and welcome to another one of these Instagram Lives. Um, as those of you who follow us here will know, mostly over the last sort of 18 months, we've been doing lives talking to Ukrainian teachers of English, and we're still going to be continuing doing this. Um, but I also wanted for us to branch out a little bit and maybe talk to a few different people doing other interesting things in the world of ELT. And hopefully today I'm going to be joined by a guy based in France called Vincent Richard, or Vincent Richard. Uh, I'm not sure how he wants me to pronounce his name, so um, maybe he can tell me that when he joins. Um, bear with me for a minute and I'll just wait for him to join us. Um, I know he's quite new to Instagram, so, um, you know, uh, maybe a bit of a learning curve for him just to work out what's going on with it all. Um, Vincent, uh, if you are there at some point, let me know and I'll add you, OK? Um, hello to everyone else from a rather cold and wet North London. Thanks for joining us. Um yeah, the, the whole issue of native speakerism, I think, is something that maybe we don't talk about enough and something that I know still affects many, many, many teachers' lives and, you know, not in a good way. And I guess, you know, as a so-called native speaker myself, I do feel a kind of sense of responsibility and a sense of, I don't know, a, a need to talk about it a bit more because... In the end, as as much as it's really good, I think, for so-called non-native speaker teachers to be talking about this and agitating and pushing for, you know, equal rights, the change also has to come from native speakers ourselves um, realising, you know, the ridiculously privileged position that we're in uh, and using that position to speak out against discrimination and to encourage people to stop dividing teachers up along lines of where they were born. Let me just flick back through the list of people who've joined and see if I've missed Vincent. Um, if you are there, Vincent, please just join. Ask to join the, the live. Uh, let me have a look. I can't see him yet. If you are there already, Vincent, um, just put a message in and I'll, I'll add you and we'll go live. Um, as soon as I've got my my fixing for the day, um, we'll then go live, OK? So bear with me, bear with me. Um, I might just text him quickly. Give me one minute. Um, I'm operating on my, my phone and on my uh, desktop here. So give me a minute. OK, um, let's... Uh, yeah, sorry, so there he is. Uh, let me see... Uh, how do I add? One second. Um, yeah, Vincent, you need to request to join. Uh, at least I can see you now. Um, I can't add you from my end. One second. You need to ask to join, Vincent. Yeah, when there's more demand than supply for English teachers, native speaker becomes a de facto qualification. Um, I think that's possibly one reason, um, but as we will see, I think there are many other reasons for it. One minute, let me just um, work out how we how we get Vincent on here. Sorry. Oh, God. What a drama. Um, requests to join. I have no requests. Vincent, you need to just request to join. Sorry, mate. Um, I can't do it from... Oh, maybe I can. Wait there. Ah, total amateurs, clearly. One second. Let me just check his name. Yeah, I'm going to invite you, Vincent. Hopefully that will allow you to join. Sorry, I forgot that I had the uh, capability to do that my end. So let's hope that allows you to join. You should see something saying, join the live, and you just click it. Uh, 
um hoping you're on your phone as well it's probably easier if you are thank you for your patience everyone um first time live for vincent so you know bear with us bear with us yeah let's see what happens now you can see the option at the beginning of the chat yeah yeah thanks natalia there's a bottom at the top of the list of comments yeah i mean i've, I've asked him so you need to accept the invite vincent unable to join um <laughs> Um, let's wait and see what happens again. Not quite sure what's going on there. <sighs> Can't see this on my computer. Try your phone, Vincent, yeah? Um, often works better from phones. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry. It happens. Hi to all the people joining. Um, please bear with us. We're having a, a few little technical issues. Yeah, I'll just invite Vince again. Let's see what happens. Oh. Okay. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay. I can see a desk. But that's a good start. Off. Sorry for that, <laughs> really. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to. Uh, okay. I think it's all right. Hey. It's nice to meet it... someone even worse with technology uh, than I am. Oh, my God. I'm no digital native sorry for that <laughs> yeah, I, th I thought you, you young people were supposed to be like digital natives and it was me that was supposed to be the immigrant here <laughs> so i'm a digital immigrant sorry uh well so nice to see to see you now mm. nice to be with you at least thank you thank you, thank you very much for joining us and so remind me how do you want me to pronounce your name uh so my first name is pronounced uh vincent vincent with a French accent. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer Vincent or Vincent? Vincent is fine, yes. I'm used okay. to uh, hearing that, so that's fine, yes. Okay, okay. So, welcome, Vincent. Um, mm. Maybe you could begin by telling everyone a little bit about yourself, about who you are, what you do, and we'll, we'll kind of slowly get on to the, the native speakerism bit, which I guess is what most people are here for. Yes, sure. So uh, I teach English in, in France. Um, I've been teaching for a bit more than five years now and uh, mostly um, adult, corporate people and face to face okay. and online. And um, well, I have a CELTA uh, qualification. I'm sure that uh, most English teachers know what it's what it is. Yeah. And uh, well, well, I'm very, very excited and, and happy to be here today to talk about native speakerism and my so, experience with it. Quick, curious. Did you do the CELTA after you'd already qualified as a teacher in France? Or, or, or was the CELTA your initial entry point into teaching? No, oh, yeah, at my initial entry to teaching because uh, in the past I worked in uh, international logistics. Okay. And I changed job in uh, 29, so, sorry, 2018. And then I passed the CELTA and started teaching in 2019. So you, you gave up a, a, what sounds like a very lucrative career in international logistics to become an English yeah. teacher. <laughs> I definitely uh, made more money for, uh, well, uh, it was very stressful as well. Very interesting, but stressful as a job and uh, I wanted to uh, to change yeah job so I I uh, had some troubles finding um, ideas and uh, then definitely teaching English turned out to be the best option for me what, what appealed to you about the idea of teaching sorry what, what appealed to you about the oh, idea of teaching well, I had um, I had never taught before i mean it was uh it was new but i i really liked the idea of um helping people and um and i've always loved english so um i definitely um yes tried to uh, to become an english teacher and i had uh, uh well the celta i 
I think is a very good means um, because it's relatively short as a training and you can you can get to teach pretty rapidly and that's what I wanted. I, I guess the, the reason I ask is because, I mean, I used to be a CELTA trainer and one of the things that started annoying me about CELTAs was I actually ended up feeling that they were a kind of part of the system of native speaker privilege because I was getting this sort of weird mix of people who were like young native speakers like I was when I started teaching. And then I was also getting like a lot of non-native speaker teachers who were already very well qualified, who'd done like pedagogical degrees in their own country, who were bilingual, who had like six, seven years teaching experience, who, who knew English inside out. And they felt that the only way for them to progress as teachers was to do the CELTA. So, I mean, it's interesting that you came into it in the same way as I came into it, which is it was your initial gateway in, yeah? Yeah, sure. Yes. It should be. Yeah, so I had all sorts of uh, profiles with me at the CELTA. I mean, yes, uh, obviously lots of native English speakers, people who had already taught for years and uh, they needed this uh, qualification. Uh, but a lot of non-native English speakers um, love English as well. And well, Where did you think, for instance? Where did you do your CELTA? Oh, well, I did it in Lyon uh, with the ELT hub. Maybe you know, oh. yeah, well, it's pretty famous, isn't it? And uh, yeah, it was great. It was a very life-changing experience and uh, yeah. very, very hard. Uh, it, yeah, for about one month. So I had to work very hard and it was definitely no piece of cake for me. And um, yeah. But at that time, when I took the CELTA, I didn't expect uh, native speakerism to be so problematic, in fact, and uh, so much of an obstacle for me to find work after the CELTA. So I guess before we move on and just talk a bit more about, you know, your own experiences of native speakerism, and I can see already people in the comments have had their own experiences as well. Should we just try and sort of have a, a broad definition of, of what it is for, for the uninitiated? How, how would you define it yourself, native speakerism? Yeah, so, so it's been defined uh, by many people before me, but uh, it's basically an ideology according to which uh, native speakers of a particular language are, um, well, that's to say people who have spoken this language as their first language since birth are the best language models and uh, also the best language teachers. The best teachers of this particular language um, I think yeah that's the definition of it to put it short yes yeah uh, yeah 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 and, and I guess it's then seeing that enact through various policies and seeing school hiring policies reflecting that and you know parent preferences reflecting that and all that kind of thing as well yeah when did it start becoming something you were aware of uh, um well pretty early when i started to uh, look for work after my celta so back in 2019 um at that time i didn't have experience teaching so that's uh that was really kind of hard uh, to find work but um i was told many times that um i was not fit for the the job because I was not a native English speaker. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, I, I've had lots of um, lots of emails from language schools telling me that uh, I couldn't do the job for this very reason. In fact, and despite the fact that in the European Union it's technically illegal to advertise on the basis of nationality, right? Exactly, yes, 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 yes. We've got the European Charter of Fundamental Rights and especially uh, Article 21 uh, about discrimination and it's definitely illegal, yes. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and by the way, you may have, you probably have heard of Rachel Tattery, an English teacher who took legal action before me in the uh, in Germany about two years ago. Yeah, 
Do you want to say a bit more about that? Because I'm guessing there will be some people out there who don't know about that. And I'll make a note to link to that later because I have the article somewhere. Okay, yes, sure. Yes, so uh, in fact, I was really uh, happy to uh, find out about her story on social media uh, some time ago because at, at that time I didn't, uh, well, I hadn't received any reply from the Defender of Rights yet. So I was feeling a bit like depressed uh, and alone, well, lonely, in fact. And um, so when I, when I read this story of um, Rachel Tetri, so who took legal action uh, in 2022 against uh, Inlingua, so uh, relatively, relatively famous and big language school. Where, where's Rachel originally? Is she, is, am I right in thinking she's Greek? Uh, yes, if I'm yeah. Yes, she's Greek and uh, very and so yeah. So she she was for some reason she was in Germany at that time and she was looking for work and she had her application turned down explicitly because uh, she was not a native English speaker and in spite of all the the amazing background that she had, okay, definitely she was more experienced than me and qualified. She had she has a Celta and a Delta as well. And even so, uh, so her application was turned down. And even if the school at that time was was uh, in need of, a, of an English teacher, <laughs> crazy, yeah, crazy story. Yeah, yeah. And she successfully sued the school, right? She didn't go to court. Actually, she uh, managed to uh, to um, she to reach a, a settlement. Yes. Uh, some kind of agreement with the uh, language school okay. and, and she got 3,000 euros as a compensation for the prejudice caused. Yeah. So, and, uh, well, what, where do you think it stems from this idea that, that you have to be a native to be able to teach something? What, what, what would you think the roots of it are? Well, I think there is uh, this idea that, um, English language belongs to uh, North America or uh, the United Kingdom, certain certain regions of the world, which is obviously ridiculous and wrong. And uh, yes, so I'm I don't know exactly where it stems from, but I mean, it's got to do with uh, yes, uh, um, this idea that. Uh, not every accent is okay, and uh, it's very often linked to racism as well. So, yeah, yeah. quite tricky to explain in depth, but yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute, because I think that's a very interesting kind of side effect of a lot of what we're talking about. I guess there's also, and I don't know what your experience on the CELTA was, I think the fact that there's this kind of emphasis on monolingual teaching, and English only classrooms and this kind of denial of the competence that a lot of bilingual teachers bring to the classroom and I, I think that must come from the roots of like CELTA courses and teaching English as a foreign language where often it was based in the UK and maybe you were teaching multilingual groups of students and you couldn't be expected to know all of their languages so maybe there was this idea that you know only speak in English in the classroom please and you know you can argue that that makes sense in an English multilingual context but most teachers in the world who teach English aren't in that context most teachers are like yourself you know speakers of a first language that a lot of your students will share yeah. and you've been through the learning journey that they're going through and i think in lots of ways a lot of what you might call non-native speaker teachers have that kind of advantage that native speakers are a bit scared of to be honest because it's like oh you understand your students first language oh it's a bit scary um you know can't you just speak in english only please because then that kind of takes away your advantage so I've always wondered how much of it was to do with that and how much of it was just to do with this idea that classrooms should be English only. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's uh, definitely an advantage, an advantage to, um, to have learned 
English as a second language myself. So when you're a non-native English speaker teacher, you you have some advantage over native uh, teachers. So um, and there was yeah there was an obsession with uh, speaking only in English during CELTA courses. Uh, yeah, and, but and, and, yeah, I find it a bit ridiculous. Yes, to just uh, ignore completely the, the learner's first language uh, because, um, yeah, as for me, um, talking about my experience, it's been very useful sometimes to resort to uh, the student's first language to to make them feel more confident to clarify certain items of language and uh, yeah I think sometimes using uh, students first language can be can be fine I mean yeah yeah absolutely I mean for, for me as a language learner I've, I've always learned from people who also speak my own first language and that that continues even when I've got really good in the foreign language I mean like my best foreign language is Indonesian and still sometimes I need Need to resort to English and sometimes I need to translate things and sometimes I see things in Indonesian and the only way I can process what they mean is to kind of put them back into English and then I later and then I kind of absorb them and they become part of me but the idea that somehow my first language would not be allowed to seems insane to me you know I always wonder when I hear people like native speakers say classrooms should be English only. It's like, have you learned a foreign language yourself only using that foreign language? Because I'll be surprised if you have. Exactly, yes. Yeah, there are lots of, yeah, lots of uh, preconceived ideas that have been around for probably too long and which are a bit ridiculous, but they're being questioned, uh, I think, now, so it's good. Yeah. And you said something about the racism that's sort of often inherent as well in the native speakerism. Do you, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, as for me, I, I, I think I'm very lucky because I'm a white Western European. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't call that racism. Uh, I mean, what, what happened to me? It's just discrimination, stupid discrimination that shouldn't have happened anyway. But, but if, for, so for example, uh, yeah, well, because when we talk about native speakerism, um, if we go a little bit deeper, obviously, even if you are a native speaker of English, you don't have the same chances, uh, whether you're uh, an American or a British, or if you're Indian, for example, yeah, South African, I don't know. There are so many countries. And, uh, and yes, sometimes... Uh, your skin color, for example, is taken into account as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you see it sometimes in adverts. I mean, I know China's particularly bad for this, where you get job adverts basically saying like, you know, blonde, white, native speaker, female wanted for English teaching yes, job. Yes. <laughs> and it's so shocking. Seriously, it is really shocking. And, and I know stories of British born people who are from non-white backgrounds who have been discriminated against because their name doesn't look sufficiently English, whatever that's supposed to mean, yes. or because they have photos and people look at the photos and kind of go, oh, not what I was expecting. And I was also reading about the, the Aya Nakamura thing in France at the moment. Oh, For yes. those of you that don't know yeah. this, yes, she's I a heard very famous it. You know, she's originally born in Mali, but she moved to France when she was two. And she's, it's been suggested that she sings at the Olympics. And lots of people are saying, well, oh, she's, not, she's not really French, though. And, you know, obviously what they mean is, is, is to do with skin colour and ethnic origin. And, and that idea of kind of policing who can and who can't be regarded as something. You know, I think it's it's really insidious, and it, it's just another way of dividing people up, which is very unhelpful. Exactly. Yes. 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 It's r ridiculous, and so it's deeply in, ingrained. Yes, in our society, and um, racism is, as we know, and native speakerism in English language teaching and even other languages is really. Uh, it's been around for very long. Yes. So that's not easy. Yeah. To 
to get rid of it. Uh, should we? Well, I, I don't think we can really uh, end native speakerism. In fact, no, I, I think it's, uh, it's just to do with pushing back. You no, know? and I think what part of the problem is, and maybe you've got your own experience of this, that it's something that kind of affects both the, the oppressors and the oppressed in some ways so you definitely get native speakers who have this kind of over inflated sense of their own competence or talents or abilities often it's kind of like quite a fragile defensive thing in disguise but you also get a lot of non-native speakers who are very judgmental of each other who will say to you things like, ah, oh, she can't be a real teacher. Have you heard her accent? Yes. Um, or non-natives who don't want to be taught by other natives. Um, so, you know, I, I think like any system where you have a power thing, you have the prejudices of the people at the top, which pass themselves down to people who are part of the system of being oppressed by this, you know? Yes. And you some non-native speaker teachers who still fetishize and believe that natives are the best teachers. Yes, yes. And we sometimes feel, I felt uh, ashamed, you know, in a way uh, of being a non-native English speaker, which is, yes, which is, uh, which shouldn't have happened. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, yes, well, it's, uh, and I, I was often told very, um, very strange things by language schools. Like, uh, for example, um, some of them um, are willing to take me on, but just uh, to teach lower levels, you know, from uh, A1 to B1. So basically uh, beginners to intermediate learners, but not beyond, not higher levels, I mean. And this is something I've heard quite a lot, yeah, in fact. Yeah, it's very common, I think, that. Yeah, exactly. It's happened to me recently. I've just started a collaboration with a school, and I know from the start I will never teach uh, upper-intermediate learners, for example. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah. frustrating and unfair. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, as, as one of the privileged people here, I'm trying to imagine how that must make you feel and how how frustrating and how just annoying that must be. You know, after all the time and effort you put into learning the language yourself, to then be pushed back and told that your experience and your effort can only take you so far. It must be very, very difficult to, to contain the, yeah. the frustration it causes. Exactly. It's affected me a lot. And... Uh... Yeah, recently I've had good news, so I feel better off today. But uh, honestly, over the last uh, year, I would say a uh, year and a half, I've had some very harsh times. I sometimes found myself teaching, but I couldn't like switch off from, from yes, from these ideas about native speakerism. Even while teaching, I was yeah. So it's it affects many teachers worldwide and uh, again I feel relatively lucky compared to other teachers and uh, um, yeah I, I couldn't let go of that I mean I had to to do something uh, and uh, yeah today I'm happy because it's it's, uh, it's been fruitful it's been uh, it, yeah. it's, it's something I talk enough about is it's the kind of impact on I mean teaching stressful as it is for, for anyone whoever's teaching and to have that extra stress and that extra kind of depression and self-doubt and self-questioning I think is is something we really don't talk enough about and take seriously so thank you for you know admitting it and opening up about it because I'm sure there's lots of other people listening who've been through similar kinds of emotional turmoil you know kind of coming to terms with your own I don't know realities yeah i'm reading some comments uh, i've been there myself uh so uh, yeah obviously this is very uh this is yeah widespread unfortunately still today even if we've talked about that issue for quite a long time there's 
an interesting question here about what's your take on the idea that the teacher has to master either British or American accents to sound professional. Mm. Like you can't speak a mixture of the two, it's considered unprofessional. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you define what, what is and isn't one or the other. Um, I don't know who polices these things or who gets to decide, oh, I'm sorry, you're saying that in the American one. No, hey, it's nonsense. I mean, there are all kinds of super professional people out there in all walks of life doing amazing things who don't have either British or American accents or they have a mixture of all kinds of different accents or they have strong Spanish accents or they have whatever accents they've got and they're doing what they're doing because they're professional and they're good at what they do. And it's, it's the accent is sort of irrelevant. Um, and anyone who's sitting there judging someone's accent rather than judging the human being they're dealing with, I think has some kind of a problem personally. So yeah, thank you for asking that, Christina. Um, yeah. Oh, look, you see, you are getting all of the French love there, Vincent. I love the French accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, accent is very, it's very, uh, very personal. It's, it's part of your identity, and uh, I, I think a lot of people um, by, by accent they mean pronunciation. You know, there's something. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, people who know nothing about language teaching they, they say, "Oh, you, this, this person, um, he or she doesn't have, have the, the the right accent," but they mean pronunciation, in fact. Don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. There's, there's a lot of education <laughs> to do uh, about that, but. Um, so, do, do you want to talk a bit more about the way you've tried to fight back against all of this? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, so uh, I took my well, I took my case to the Defender of Rights, which is an equality body. Uh, that we have here in France, but uh, wherever you are in Europe, you most probably have um, an equality body in your country as well, which can help you for free to enforce your rights if you've been a victim of discrimination, for example. And, and uh, I will put a link, um, um, yes, uh, to, to find out more about these equality bodies um, in France. In, in, sorry, in Europe, not just in France. Uh, and even outside Europe, you, you probably have uh, institutions like, like, like this. And, um, but, well, the, the problem is that the Defender of Rights um, doesn't, is not like a lawyer, okay? It doesn't act as a lawyer. So if you want to get financial compensation, if you want to go to court, if you want to go further, uh, you need to hire a lawyer, which is uh, not free anymore. So I've done both, in fact, and uh, here I am today, um, trying to get. And yeah. What, what kind of results have you had with it? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah. So, sorry. What what kind of results have you had oh. from pursuing these kind of paths of action? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The sound is very bad on my phone. Uh, originally, I. I I wanted to attend uh, the live on my computer, but I couldn't anyway. Uh, um, so, so the Defender of Rights, uh, after, after a year and a half of waiting, has finally made a decision about one discrimination case uh, I had reported uh, to them. And um, so they uh, have decided to support me after investigating, okay, asking questions to the offender, asking for documents, it's, take, it's taken a lot of time, in fact. But I've, there is uh, a decision now which uh, has been published on their website. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a very good news because it's like a, a precedent um, to which one can refer in the future if this kind of discrimination discrimination happens again yeah and uh yeah so and this week i had uh, um i received a, a call from my lawyer and another very good news because this particular language school concerned by the decision 
has finally agreed um, to give me uh, some some money as a compensation. It's good. It's yeah. good. Do, do, do they they also have to change their policy going forward or not, or can but, they just somehow sort of buy me out of this this awkward incident? So, so um, yeah. In fact, so the defender of rights doesn't have any binding power. So it it just uh, makes recommendations. So they recommended uh, that the school uh, give me money, okay, for the prejudice caused, and also um, they were asked to change their hiring policies. Okay. And uh, yeah, forget to forget about the the native aspects and to use other um, criteria to to, uh, to assess language proficiency for the candidates. And what? What would you say to people who would argue that what will then happen is schools will just wrap up native speakerism in different language? So they will say things like looking for native like fluency or looking for C2 level fluency or those kind of things. What would you yeah. say that that's what's going to happen instead? It's true that we can see more and more um job ads with such terms as native level proficiency which is meaningless obviously and it's yeah it's developing a lot <clears throat> and uh, uh yeah i think it's quite hard to to uh, um combat this like how do you deal with that they will most probably find other means to to make uh, native speakerism linger on and uh uh, I think um, we need to challenge those people, like asking questions. What do you mean by native-like proficiency? Can you explain, yeah. etc.? Try to uh, ask uh, questions like publicly on social media. And I mean, what else can we do about that? Um, yeah, it's uh, not so easy. Yeah. It's not, but I think you're right that we all kind of have a duty to question those kinds of terms and to challenge them and call them out when we see them. And I mean, yeah, the the idea of native like fluency is just nonsensical because obviously it depends which native are we talking about. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's natives I've met who have a you know profoundly limited vocabulary and um you know in, intersperse most sentences with the word fuck um and I'm, I'm guessing they don't mean those people even though those people are natives um and i, I think it, that there's something to be said for trying to insist on schools specifying what they mean so if they mean c2 what does that mean does that mean someone who's passed proficiency you know and if what you mean is some past proficiency that's fine okay and then if you pass Efficiency, well, you should be equally considered for the job. And I, I think it's important to specify exactly what qualifications it is you're looking for, because, you know, a passport is not a qualification yes. and native like fluency isn't a qualification. So if you want qualifications, specify the qualifications you're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as long as for as long as we will see the word native in a job, advertisement uh, there will be a problem right yeah so it's all about yeah finding ways to uh, to challenge those people so that maybe one day hopefully we will only see a c2 level or proficient english user and, uh, yeah. and well, that's it experienced teacher i mean i think the funny thing is there's so many other ways you could divide teachers up if you wanted to you could say you know um experienced teachers less experienced teachers or you could actually say like bilingual teachers or monolingual teachers yeah, it's true. which is a way of framing it because that kind of reverses the native speaker privilege a lot of the time you know if you're looking for a bilingual teacher well, there, there are obviously native speakers who are also bilingual speakers of French or bilingual speakers of, you know, whatever a language. But you, you have to work to get there. You know, if I was going to come and work in France tomorrow, it would take me a long time to get my French back up to, you know, anything like the, the standard that you speak French at. 
And so, you know, for me in that respect, okay, I've got more experience. You've got more language. Yeah, it's true. true yeah. 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 Uh, 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 if the other thing is just this idea that somehow native speaker fluency is somehow a goal for students, because I think it's, 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 it's a kind of false, false goal. It's like how many people become native speakers i mean it's it's such a sort of almost unobtainable status for, for most people and i think an undesirable status i think most people i mean with my indonesian i, I recognize i'm never going to be taken for a native speaker for kind of obvious reasons you know it's like people can spot a mile away that i'm not indonesian but i also understand that i'm probably never going to get anywhere near sounding like I've spent my entire life living there um you know I lived there in the 90s my wife's Indonesian when we go back to Indonesia I speak Indonesian but I, I reckon you know and I can do everything I need to do in the language I can track I can communicate I can talk to my in-laws I can make friends there I can socialize all of those things I can do I don't need to be someone who pretends to be a native speaker and i think actually going back to that question earlier about you know do you have to have an american accent or whatever i mean very very few people need to pass them the only people who need to pretend to be native speakers are spies yes. actually exactly. i mean yes. you know if spy, it could be a matter of life or death yeah, yeah? true but, why do you really need to pass yourself off as something that you're not? It, it just seems the idea that that's that that's the end point or that's the goal. I just think it's wrong. I just think it's it's unrealistic for the vast majority of people's goals. Yeah, I think so. And so this ideology, native speakerism, I think is very often turned into a selling point that language schools use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and. It's and I don't think that in most cases, this selling point reflects uh, customers' expectations, I think. In certain cases, it might, but... Because what, one of the arguments that's put forward is we're just reflecting what the market wants. I've heard it so often, yeah. And it's... Uh, if you... Yeah, well, if you read the, the decision that's been made uh, by the Defender of Rights, it's in French, so... <laughs> I translated some paragraphs into English, but uh, they clearly said that um, this is no valid uh, reason, no valid pretext, you know, to use this argument like uh, uh, our customers demand uh, uh, native English speaker teachers. So that's the reason why we only hire natives. So no, this is not acceptable on a legal level. It's also a very slippery slope because you can use the same argument to justify not employing black teachers or Muslim teachers or gay teachers or, you, yeah. you know, oh yeah, oh, yeah they don't want gay black teachers, so I'm sorry, we can't give you a job. Yeah. And it's, it's a kind of anti-professional argument. And I think it's also, it's something that panders to people's worst prejudices. You know, it's like our customers are really prejudiced and therefore we're going to give them the prejudices that they want. It's 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 not a good way of running a business, I think. Exactly. I was. Uh, yeah, recently I had this analogy of a, a plumbing company uh, publishing a job ad advertisement. Um, yes, uh, only for um, for male plumbers <laughs> like. How, how would it sound, you know, how would people react to such ad? Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised that uh, there's like um, still today a rule of silence around native speakerism in language teaching. Uh, and I tried to figure it out how it was possible to, to still today to have this ideology so dominant, uh, in fact. And, uh, and so on top, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on, Vincent. Yeah, I mean, uh, so for the past two years, let's say, uh, I've been so taking legal action, taking my case to the Defender of Rights, but um, I've also been 
uh, in touch with lots of people in vocational training here in France to um, to really understand how this was possible. How could yeah. yes, like how come how come uh, so many language schools uh, advertise their English courses using this ideology and. And I focused on quality because in France we have this obligatory uh, certification, which is called Calliope. I don't know if you've heard of that. I have. Um, okay, well, never mind. Uh, so, um, if you don't have this uh, specific qualification as a language school, you cannot use the CPF funding. In fact, uh, so it's. Uh, uh, well, like many schools have this certification, and this is to ensure quality, the quality of English, well, language courses in general. Yeah. And I asked those people who grant the certification, uh, what link is there between the native aspects of language teachers and the quality of language courses? And... Uh, I couldn't get any meaningful answer from them. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, just because there is no no way to justify that, in fact. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's very annoying because you've got lots of language schools uh, which are Calliope certified. So they're doing a good quality job, you know, uh, high quality, they're delivering high quality language courses, but sometimes they just hire native English, uh, native language teachers who are not qualified, who have no experience teaching. So there's a problem. Do, do you think Brexit has affected any of this? Because obviously, because of the UK's kind of colossal act of self-harm by walking away from the European Union into, into the oblivion, it's obviously going to affect the ability of UK-based native speaker teachers to go and live and work in Europe. I don't know about that. Yes, maybe. Um, I wonder if that's going to start to, you know, it, it's going to lead to a, a, a... It's going to make it harder for native speaker teachers from England or Scotland or Northern Ireland or whatever yes. to go and do what lots of people used to do, which is spend two years living in France or Italy or Spain yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I wonder how that will things. Yeah, we'll see in the future. Uh, yeah. Looks like, but um, yeah, so, um, so I've been doing a lot of things <laughs> during two years and uh, I was kind of fed up with uh, waiting, only waiting. So I'm very glad today uh, because I'm breathing again in a way. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and I hope, yeah. Three, how three, have you found it? What, what kind of reaction have you got from native speakers that you talk to? Um, a lot of them are very supportive, especially on LinkedIn, where I'm very active. Um, yeah. yeah. For anyone watching who doesn't follow on LinkedIn, I'll put a link in later to his profile. And um, please do follow because... Uh, that's how I first came across him from sort of seeing how active he was over there on LinkedIn. And it was quite inspiring to see. So I'll put the link in. So yes, it's very, lots of support from native uh, speakers of English. And uh, as you said, it's, this ideology is detrimental, not only to non-natives, but also well, to the whole English language teaching community industry, right? So. You've had no kind of kickback against what you're doing not a lot of kickback um yeah i've had yes yeah, some derogatory comments uh before but yeah honestly uh not a lot i also post on facebook sometimes but uh yeah in general yes people are very supportive and uh um, well, one, one thing I I mean, one of the things when I'm really bored and I have a spare hour, I go on certain Facebook groups for teachers and, and some groups are worse than others. I mean, there's one like English teachers in Warsaw, which for some reason can be particularly toxic. And one of the th things I noticed there is 
there's definitely a certain kind of political profile connected to a lot of the people who are clinging on to this native speaker thing. And a lot of the Americans who are clinging on are also Trump fans. And a lot of the Brits who are clinging on are also Brexit supporters. <laughs> and I've often wondered about that kind of, and they're men and they're white. And I've often wondered about that kind of overlap between sort of, I don't know, white Western straight men who now somehow feel that they're under attack and their privileges are being taken away from them. And that it all, it's all kind of part of a, a spectrum of, of, of defensiveness, you know? I was posting in the stories today about native speaker fragility. Yes, and, I, and I want, you know, I think that it's, it's clearly a thing that, that it's, it's the same people who kind of, you can't even be a straight white Western man anymore. You know, like we're the victims now. I often think these guys are the guys who are the ones who are most defensive about being told that there's nothing special about them just because they have a particular passport. Yes, yes. But you know what? I, I believe that um, people in, in favor of native speakerism and especially people who run language schools, they are not so worried, in fact, about what's going on. Um, I mean, people growing aware of that. Maybe they believe that they will always find a way to uh, recruit native English speakers, for example. And, and so they just ignore people like me. This is a possibility, I think. Um, have, so. have you never been to do what I know some non-natives do, which is to, you know, pretend to be native? Um, you know, you, you, could, you could move to China and say your name is Vincent and pretend you're from Birmingham. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. This, I've never considered doing that, in fact, lying about that. Um, a lot of people uh, yeah, told me you, you should have lied. You should lie even today when you send an application, you, your application. But, yeah, why would I lie? I mean, if, uh, if it's illegal, I'm just going to, to take action. I don't want to pretend. I am I am native English speaker. I've, no, I, honestly, I, I don't think it's the right way to to address the issue. I can understand why some people have done that. Yeah, uh, I, I can understand because yeah, when you need to to find work, when you need to yeah, me yeah, yeah it was not the option that I chose. Yeah, so. and of people out there listening sort of mobilizing in future what, what advice would you give people who are facing kind of I, I saw quite a few comments from people saying oh you know I've had to move to France from Ukraine as a non-native teacher and I'm experiencing all of this now and what, what advice would you give people so yeah my advice would be even if you consider yourself as um, maybe uh, a average English teacher, even if you think you are not the best candidate for this particular English teacher position, for example, do um, take action, do stand up and enforce your rights uh, because uh, the law is, uh, uh, is with you, in fact, uh, especially in Europe. I don't know, uh, I don't really know about other parts of the world, but yeah. I don't consider myself as a prominent figure in in ELT, to say the least. But even so, I, I believe I'm a good English teacher and I'm motivated. And uh, so I deserve to to be given a chance, in fact. And, and so that's my advice. Yeah, I think. and I mean, everyone starts somewhere. And, you know, I mean, I know for me, when I first started teaching, I was completely clueless, you know, I mean, I was absolutely clueless. I had no idea what I was doing and I was lucky that people gave me a break and I was lucky that I got some support and I was lucky that people kind of mentored me and pushed me along a little bit. And I don't see why that should be exclusive to people with particular passports. You know, every teacher needs that. Every teacher needs to feel valued and every teacher needs to feel that 
they have the potential to get better and every teacher needs to feel respected for what they bring to to the classroom i think exactly uh, a good teacher has many uh, many assets many qualities skills and it's yeah it doesn't have anything to do with your place of, of birth obviously yeah. and uh, yeah so do do something yes if you feel you have been discriminated against if you've got proofs emails from recruiters if your application was turned down whereas there was uh, a clear need for te teachers in this particular school if you just reply to a job ad for example you have lots lots of reasons to take legal action and you will most probably win especially if you are in europe so even if it's it takes nerves it's sometimes uh it takes money as well if you hire a lawyer but do something yes at least you can take your case to the the equality body in your country that's free and uh all you'll have to do is wait so that's not easy but yeah you can and i, I one other thing i would would say is particularly to any native speakers out there um, you don't have to work with schools that have prejudicial policies in place um, I've stopped doing conferences for schools or doing talks at schools that I know only employ native speakers um, and you know I, I just don't want to be part of that system I don't want to be part of the, the continuing sort of perpetuation of prejudice like that and I think you know for native speakers it's also important for us to recognize the impact the the toll that all of this bullshit takes on on our colleagues from other countries uh, and the kind of harm it does people and the the fact that we can choose not to be part of it ourselves so you know hopefully that's been a positive message for both groups of teachers out there and you know we all need to be working together to move to a point where we're all respected equally i think yeah yeah definitely. vincent i'm gonna um thank you very very much for your time and thank you very much for the work that you're doing thanks to um, you yeah drop me a message with some links and things in and i'll share all of those things on our instagram and hopefully people can follow you and find out what you're doing and contact you as well if they need more advice yeah i will I will answer them uh, gladly, yes. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah, and All right. let's stay in touch. Yeah, 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 yeah. And hope to see you somewhere, yeah? Exactly, yeah. All right. Thank you, Vincent, yeah? Look after yourself. Take care. Thank you very much. You.